All right, good morning and welcome to another ePrime live stream. My name is Devin Struthers. I am the training consultant for ePrime uh, for PST. And today we're going to talk about a really cool subject. So if you were following along with today's heading, um, it you'd know that today's training is obviously going to be about ePrime audio or about Kronos audio and ePrime. So we're going to be talking about um, audio input and audio output with Kronos, but we're also going to be making a bit of a task today too. So the task today we're going to be making is a little bit of a modified version of what you can find in the Kronos Features Explorer. Uh, and it also has to do with a task that I've actually seen a couple of users uh, come through support with and have questions about. So it's actually going to be really useful for those of you who are making this type of task. Now the task I'm going to be um, demonstrating today is going to be um, an object naming task. So I'm going to have uh, an image appear on the screen and participants are going to have so long to um, just make an audio response so they'll be able to say, hey, you know, this picture is a picture of a cat or a dog or something like that. And um, not only is it going to uh, register what they, uh, what they said and record that for a sound file that you can listen to later, but it's also going to use the voice key that's packed inside Kronos and it's going to mark the reaction time for how long it took participants to say the word that the image is. And then not only is it doing all of that, but we're going to use the uh, audio output feature in Kronos to play the sound that participants made or the word that participants said back to them to see if it's correct or see if they agree with it. So it's going to be kind of a really cool experiment that we're making today. It's going to showcase a lot of the different features of Kronos. And I'm also going to talk a lot about some of the, you know, issues that people run into with Kronos when, you know, recording audio or playing audio, those types of things. Because we do get these kinds of questions pretty frequently because, you know, Kronos does a lot. And there's a lot to kind of unpack with everything that Kronos has. So there's a lot to go over today. So it's going to be a really cool webinar. So... If you have any questions, you know, feel free to go ahead and ask me while the webinar is going on. I'm always happy to answer questions, you know, while you guys are uh, while you guys are watching. Uh, if you guys are watching and this isn't a live stream, it's actually pre-recorded, or you know, you're not watching during the live stream time, feel free to leave a comment in the uh, in the comment section. It should be right about down there. And if you guys, you know have any suggestions for videos feel free to subscribe to this page and then let me know you know what you guys would like to see in a future live stream i'm always happy to kind of tailor these to what uh, i know I'm, what i know you guys want so let's go ahead and jump right in so the first thing we're going to do in our experiment is just to make chronos or to add chronos to the experiment in the first place so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go ahead and double click on the experiment object at the top of the structure window here and i'm going to click on the devices tab now the devices tab in eprime for those of you who are new to eprime this is all of the devices on your computer that eprime currently has access to so the obvious ones are the display if we're going to show participants you know something on the screen keyboard, uh, if I want to type, mouse, if I want to use my mouse to interact with anyone or anything on the screen, sound, if I'm going to be playing sound, that's going to be important today. Uh, button device and script device aren't necessarily devices on your computer, but they're devices in ePrime. And having these two things here enables us to really do a lot of cool things with ePrime and add another level of just, you know, another level of functionality to ePrime 3. So if you're using ePrime 2, you can definitely follow along. Just know that, you know, the button object and the script device, they're not going to be there in your experiment, but we're not really going to rely on them much today anyway. So to add a Kronos to your experiment, what you would have to do is click Add at the bottom and then select Kronos from here. Now, if you have ePrime 3, please note that Kronos actually comes pre-installed on ePrime 3. So, you know, I didn't install anything special aside from just ePrime 3, and Kronos is actually listed as the second object there. Um, if anyone has ePrime 2 and they're following along, know that you will have to install Kronos separately. And, and when you bought Kronos, you should have received a little installation disk. That's how you install Kronos on ePrime 2. So go ahead and install that, restart your computer, and you should see Kronos in this list as well. So uh, now that I have Kronos, I'm going to select OK and it's going to be added right there. Now there is a fun little trick that I have to do whenever I'm playing sound through Kronos because right now I have a sound out object or a sound out device. And if I double click on my sound device, it's playing through the API called Core Audio. Now Core Audio is just a uh, sound API that comes installed standard on Windows computers um, and it has to do with the sound card in your computer. Now the benefit of playing audio through Kronos and I actually have one right here in Kronos and it's included microphone which is right here um, the benefit of playing or playing or recording 
um, audio through Kronos is that it takes the computer sound card out of the equation. There's actually a sound card built into the response device that is Kronos. And the nice thing about having that sound card inside is that you can get consistent audio latency or sound onset latency as we call it or I'm going to reference it a lot today. Get consistent sound onset latency between computers. So let's say I'm running on this laptop and if I were to play a sound through this laptop it has to go through the computer sound card uh, and it has to use this API and there's a lot of factors that go into that um, that are going to really impact my sound onset latency. So then if I take this same experiment and put it on another computer, that's going to have a different sound card, possibly different sound API. Uh, it's going to have different speakers that I'm playing through, and it's going to just add another level of complexity and probably completely change my sound onset latency from my laptop here. And that's a big problem if you're doing something like an EEG study, you know, something like event-related potential, where participants actually hear the sound that's playing through the computer and they're supposed to react to that sound. If you have different sound onset latencies, participants are going to be reacting at different times to the same sound and that ends up being a real problem in research. That's why we developed Kronos is because not only does it maintain uh, consistent millisecond accurate sound onset latency, but it is extremely fast and I'll show you exactly how fast we're talking in a second. But basically with Kronos, if you're playing in one of the different mix modes, which is something we're going to talk about later if you're playing in mix mode one, um, you get sound onset latency of less than one millisecond, which is phenomenal. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about, you know, exactly setting up those properties and what they mean a little later, but that's why we would want to play sound through Kronos in the first place. Because I mean, if you look at Kronos, it kind of just looks like a response box. It doesn't look like, it doesn't look like there's a really great sound card in there, but I promise it's actually right there. All right, so now that we have our Kronos added, we need to actually tell E-Prime to play sound through Kronos instead of through the computer sound card. To do that, we have to go into this API section here in the sound device, and we have to select Kronos and click OK. Now, there's a little quirk when adding Kronos as a sound object in E-Prime or setting that sound API to Kronos in E-Prime. You have to actually take Kronos and you have to move it up here so it's just before the sound device. Now it can be anywhere before the sound device. I can even move it up so it's before the keyboard or before the display if I want. The point is that it appears higher in this list than the sound device. Now the reason for that is because E-Prime actually initializes each and every one of these devices in order. It will first initialize the display device, then the keyboard, then the mouse. Now the reason Kronos needs to be before the sound device is because the API here is Kronos. And if the API is Kronos, Kronos has to actually exist in E-Prime as a device. Now, if it shows up before it, um, or if the, the Kronos shows up before the sound device like this, the E-Prime is going to get to the sound device and go, Kronos, what's that? I don't know what that is. And then it'll cause an error. But if we take the Kronos device and put it before the sound device, it'll load Kronos and all of its audio properties. Then it'll get down to your sound device and go, Kronos, I know what that is, and it's going to keep going. So that's one of the little nuanced parts of, um, of adding Kronos uh, as a sound playback object. But it's really the only nuanced part. Um, the rest of it's pretty straightforward. So let's go ahead and click on Kronos. And I'm going to show you probably my favorite feature of it. So for those of you who are used to uh, response devices in E-Prime and, and actually adding them into E-Prime, you'll know that you know, generally speaking, they'll be available on you know, either a COM or LPT port. And you have to figure that much out using your computer's device manager beforehand. Fortunately for the Kronos, it's integrated directly with E-Prime. It's made to work with E-Prime, so E-Prime knows if one of them are attached. So if I click on this device index here, um, there's a little device listing button here, and it'll tell me, I have a Kronos, here's its serial number, and by the way, it's attached. And you know that that's kind of a live feed, and we can test that if I just unplug Kronos. You can hear my computer literally detaching it. Click OK there, and it says device index 1 not attached. And if I refresh that table, it says not attached. So now I'll know whether or not uh, E-Prime actually sees Kronos before I even start to run my experiment, which is going to be really nice. And if I plug my USB in here, into the back of Kronos. You're going to see blue lights flash on the Kronos. I have a light in front of me, so it might have been a little washed out. But you see blue lights flash on Kronos. That's Kronos letting you know that it's OK. So if those lights show up as anything other than blue when you plug Kronos in, that means there's some problem with this setup here. And you know that'll be something that you have to troubleshoot either with myself and technical support or with your lab. Um, but you know it, it's just it's a status indicator to let you know that Kronos is functioning properly. So um, the reason why it didn't show up is attached there is I need to refresh the list, so it is attached. 
All right, so now that I have Kronos set up and added to the experiment, and I know that my experiment can see Kronos, um, let's go ahead and just check out the audio out and audio in properties. Now, I do go over a lot of these other properties later, and especially next week we're going to be going over analog and digital signals. So if you're interested in analog and digital signals with Kronos, which is another thing that it can do, which makes it really, really cool, trust me, um, I do go over those a little later, but today we're just going to go over the audio out and audio in. So as far as audio out is concerned, um, the, the, one of the bigger things that I was talking about a little bit earlier was this mix mode property. And right now it's set to mix mode one and there's the option of mix mode two. Now they both really serve um, two separate functions, but most of the case for like probably 99% of users, mix mode one is going to be exactly what you need. So mix mode one is meant to play sound at the highest possible frequency that you can. So as soon as it gets loaded into the Chrono sound buffer, it just shoots it out. Um, generally speaking, we can get about less than one millisecond, about one millisecond to less than one millisecond on sound onset latency with mix mode one, um, especially if you're setting everything up correctly in Kronos. But that's what the majority of people are going to need in, in or from Kronos, is they're going to need mix mode one. Most of the time you're not doing any sort of sound, active sound mixing in E-Prime, you're not gonna be layering sounds or anything like that. So mix mode one is exactly what you're gonna want. Now, if you are doing more complex things in E-Prime three with Kronos sound, and you're mixing sounds together, you're overlapping sounds, those kinds of things. Like I said, this really isn't um, too predominant of a use case. I end up seeing maybe one or two um, experimenters do this per year. Um, then you're going to want mix mode two. Now the point of mix mode two is it doesn't necessarily play sounds as fast as possible. It plays sounds with the exact same sound onset latency. So you have a very consistent sound onset latency, latency instead of a very fast but possibly variable by like one millisecond but possibly variable sound onset latency so in this case if I have mix mode 2 I would set my buffer size to six milliseconds and that means that every time I play a sound through mix mode 2 I'm going to get a sound onset latency of a very very consistent six milliseconds which means I can then account for that in my data later so you know if I'm doing an event related potential study and I see brain activity that's spiking and it looks a little off, I can then subtract six milliseconds from that because I know that E prime, you know, there's a six millisecond delay between when E prime says play the sound and when you actually hear it on Kronos. But if you're using mix mode one, that's not something you need to take into account at all. Uh, mix size, again, mostly for mix mode two. These two properties are honestly mostly for mix mode two here. But um, mix size uh, lets you know how much of the sound that you're going to play is going to be loaded into Kronos before it begins playing. And buffer size, again, is what that sound onset latency is going to, tor going to turn into. Now uh, you can adjust the volume on Kronos' sound out here. Generally, we just find that most people here, um, or most people with Kronos, just like you know the default value for that digital gain there. I don't recommend changing that. Um, so now we have um, onset thresholds and offset thresholds here uh, for the audio out digital gain for the pseudo buttons for the right and left channels. Now that sounds like a lot, but basically what it is, and if I hop over here to responses, I have um, an option here for audio left and audio right uh, pseudo buttons. So basically, and I can activate them by clicking on them like this or unactivate them by clicking on them again. But by default, they're not active. But basically what this means is if I ever want E prime to do something or pretend like a button was pressed or act like the response happened based on the exact millisecond that something started playing out of my Kronos speakers, um, either the left channel or the right channel, I would add these two into my experiment. And these properties down here, the onset and offset thresholds are just letting me know the sensitivity that I'm using. So the onset threshold is the sensitivity of, you know, how sensitive do I need E prime speakers to be in order to, to let me know that it's currently playing a sound and then how sensitive do I need the speakers to be to let me know when it stopped playing that sound. So onset is when it started playing, offset's when it actually stopped playing. So, um, and you can do that for two audio channels. You can do that for the right audio channel here and the left audio channel here. Uh, and that post offset interval is um, by how much on the, before the beginning and before the end of the sound presentation am I paying, it, or is Kronos paying attention? So it's paying attention to right now by default three milliseconds on either side, it just gives you a little buffer for the sound. But that's really all of the properties for audio out that we need to even look at. But the thing with Kronos that's really nice is it's kind of set up to just work. So there's nothing I really need to change here.
Now as far as the audio in is concerned, there are a few properties that you may need to change depending on your experiment design. Now the first one is file name. And file name is, um, I mean, if you look here, it has an at and then auto here. That's just a little shortcut that we named. So at auto refers to this next row here. So at auto definition. So what does this at auto even mean? Because if you look here, you can't really change it. So at auto here means data file dot base name. So this is what all of our um, this is what all of our uh, sound files are going to be named once I start recording them. And it's going to be really important for later. And more specifically, referencing this is going to be important for later. So my file name is going to be at auto, and it's right here. So first, it's going to be data file .base name. And data file .base name, for those of you who are familiar with ePrime, you're going to know that it's, it's just the name of the experiment, dash the subject, dash the session, and then you know, .e.2 or whatever. That's what that data file base name is. So it's actually going to take the same name as the uh, as the edat file that you're going to be playing. Um, device. So through what device am I playing this? Log level. So it's going to let me know if I'm on the block level, the trial level, the sub trial, those types of things. And this at increment is actually just going to auto increment every time I save a sound file, which is really nice because if I end up having two or three or four sound recordings all in one trial and in, in or all in one log level. ePrime isn't going to automatically overwrite those, it's just auto increments. So you get all of those sound files without needing to do really any work with incrementing what your data file or what your sound file is going to be. Now, keep in mind, you can definitely, definitely change this if you want. Um, you can change this to whatever you want it to be called, and you can do the auto increment stuff yourself. But this is just a really nice, easy way to automatically tell what participant and what trial participants are speaking to. This is another cool feature here, this data file column name. So once you record a sound object, and I'm going to actually demonstrate this later, but once you record sound in ePrime, what's going to happen is in your data file, it actually makes a column for your sound file, and you can play it directly from that column in your EDAT file. And I'll show you that later. A recording format, so how do I want it? Now, how do I want to record this? I'm just going to keep it at its default. Uh, Preamp gain, so before I start talking, what's the gain? I'm going to keep it onto auto and then start and stop mode. So start and stop mode are actually pretty um, pretty important. Now the start mode here is either immediate or onset. So when it begins recording, am I? <laughs> I just got a little bit of feedback that I am a little fuzzy. Thank you very much for that. Um, so the start mode here is, um, the start mode for immediate here is actually, you know, whenever I call start recording, is it going to start recording right away? Or is it going to wait until the onset of the next object to begin recording? So um, I'm going to say immediate because I want it to start recording as soon as I tell it to start recording. And then stop mode is, am I going to sync stop recording or sync um, audio, the, the stop recording of the sound in object, um, with the offset of an object or am I actually just going to stop whenever I tell it to stop and I'm actually going to be manually telling it to stop so I want my stop mode to be normal right here and then pre offset interval and post offset interval lets me know so if I tell ePrime to start recording through the mic it's actually actively listening to how long I'm going to be recording um, or it's actually actively listening to you know when I'm going to be recording and this pre offset interval and post or pre and post onset interval here it actually just gives me a buffer room before and after my recording so before I call ePrime to start recording it's actually going to start recording 250 milliseconds before I tell it to start and it's going to do that just so you know just in case I don't miss anything and then the same with that post offset interval there it's going to record up to 500 milliseconds after I stop talking because you know it'll just be really nice to record just a little bit at the end just in case I may have said something by accident at the end or anything like that and then duration lets me know how long I'm recording for and I'm just going to keep it at infinite for now because I am going to purposely tell ePrime to stop recording and then this onset and offset threshold is just um, literally just a threshold to let me know, hey, you know, how loud do I have to be talking in order for ePrime to pick up that I've begun talking, and how loud before I um, before ePrime determines that I've stopped talking. So if you ever have any questions about any of these properties, by the way, we actually have a really useful help that I'm not sure too many people know about. If you click on this little question mark in the top right hand corner here, um, it'll ask you how you want to open it. I'll just open it in Google Chrome but it's going to actually open up this and this is the Kronos device properties and it's actually a really really cool bit of um, really cool article here it actually goes into every single property that you can see in Kronos 
uh, in Kronos, whether it's general, like the general tab, the LED tab, the audio out tab, and then it tells you exactly what each one of these properties does and what it, you know, how it affects your experiment. So this is a really good place to go if you, even if you follow along with the webinar today and you go, I still have no idea how this works. Or if you're more visual like I am and you really like to read this kind of stuff, um, you can check out the different audio properties here in the audio out and audio in tab. And it even goes, like I said, into the nitty gritty of what absolutely every property is. And if there are any nuances to each property, what those are. So this is an awesome resource if you have any questions about that. But now that I have talked forever about all the properties, let's go ahead and jump in and actually make the experiment. And then I'll go into some caveats too after that. So the first thing that we're going to do today is we're going to do a very simple welcome screen like I do with absolutely every one of these live streams if you've been following along with me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a text display object and I'm going to go ahead and rename this one just to welcome. Now I renamed it to welcome pretty quickly. Um, I've been using Prime for a while. But uh, what I did to rename it was I just right clicked on it, clicked F2 to rename, uh, or just clicked on this rename button here, uh, and then just typed the word welcome. Now I'm going to go ahead and double click on this to open it in the workspace. And I'm just going to type a very simple welcome message, just letting participants know what we're doing in this task today. I'm just going to say welcome to the experiment. No, I'll spell experiment, right? There we go. You will be shown a series of pictures. Please say the name of the picture out loud as clearly as possible. Press any button on the Kronos to begin. Now of course when you're doing your experiment you might not want to be as explicit as this. Um, I'm just letting you guys know that you know we're going to be using the Kronos as the response device as well. So we're really going to be using a lot of function, functions of the Kronos today. I don't know if you necessarily care that your participants know exactly what this response device is called. So what we're going to do is go ahead and click on the properties page in the upper left hand corner there. Click on the duration input tab. I'm going to set my duration to infinite. Set my data logging to time audit only. I'm going to add a Kronos input mask and I'm going to keep my allowable set to any so they can actually just press any button they want. Now if I want them to press any specific button I would just type the name of that button so either one two three four or five um, and then if you're wondering how each of the different um, I'll keep that as any if you're wondering how each of the different features of Kronos are going to actually apply to your allowable column here so let's say I have a foot pedal and I want participants to step on the foot pedal or if I have you know in analog out or an analog in or you know the voice key which is what we're going to be using later that responses section of Kronos is actually really great for that so if I go into devices and click on Kronos and go over to responses this is exactly what I'm talking about here so if you look here here are each one of the five Kronos buttons so I mean obviously from left to right just the five blue buttons on the front of Kronos um, the voice key is number six and we'll be using that a little later so remember that uh, if I'm using analog in, if I have a photo sensor, and then what you see above here, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, that's how you would reference those in your allowable uh, column in your experiment. So, like I said, we'll keep in mind that Chrono's voice keys a 6 for a little later. Alright, so now that I am done with my welcome screen, let's go ahead and make another object here. It's just going to be a list object from our toolbox. And we'll just drag it and drop it like I did there. And we'll go ahead and rename this one to block list. There we go. And we're going to double click on it to open it in the workspace. Now my procedure here is going to be block proc. It doesn't exist, but I like to create it. I'm going to say yes. Would I like to make the de default value for newly created levels? I'm going to go ahead and say no just for this uh, for this case. And then I'm going to open my block proc. Now I talk about this kind of a lot in a lot of these live streams. If I ever go from block proc just to trial proc right away, um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to message me. Um, you know, we've already been getting a couple of questions and a couple, you know, little bits of feedback. So I mean, definitely let me know if you have any questions why I'm doing that. But we do cover it pretty extensively in a lot of the other live streams. I, I think I almost talk about it every single time I do it. So if you have any questions, by all means, let me know. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep going and assume that you, you know, kind of understand why I'm setting it up like this. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add another list object to my block proc here, and I'm going to rename this one to trial list. 
and hit enter. I'm going to double click on it to open it in the workspace. And my procedure here is going to be trial proc. It does not exist when I like to create it. Of course I would. And would I like to make it the default value for newly created levels? For this one, I'm going to say yes. Now I'm going to say yes to this one specifically because I'm going to be using or I'm going to be using the trial proc or the trial list specifically to add all of my independent variables and there's actually going to be a lot of them because I have a few pictures to display. So what I'm going to do is double click on the trial list now and just click on add attribute. Now I'm going to call this attribute stim image. Um, similar to how I've been naming a lot of my E objects, I like my attribute names to kind of reflect the function of the attribute itself. So the purpose of this is it's going to be displaying a stimulus image to participants. So I'm just going to call this one stim image. Now I have quite a few images to load into this experiment. I actually have them on a folder in my desktop. So if I double click on this, I have it in audio in and out. And if I go over here, you'll see that I have a finished version of the experiment. But I also have all of these, you know, very simple images. So picture of an apple, picture of a bottle, picture of a birthday cake, picture of some coffee, picture of a present, those types of things. These are what I'm going to want to load into my experiment. So all I need to do in order to load them in the experiment, since I'm going to inevitably save this experiment in the same place as this audio in and out version of the task, um, I'm going to just reference them by their name and then a period and then their file extension. So what I want to do is hop back into my E-Prime experiment which is right here. And I just want to call this one, I'll first call it Apple. I actually want this to be case sensitive as well. So I have everything capitalized except for Y and I'm gonna rename that quick. There we go, whoops, there we go. All right, so Y is capitalized and everything else is capitalized. So then that makes my life a lot easier when referencing these. So I have apple.jpg. And then I'm going to save this experiment. Now the reason I'm going to save it is because since I'm referencing it specifically just as the file name, it actually needs to be in the same location as these files. And right now, since it's not saved, it doesn't really live anywhere. So I'm going to save this in audio in and out. And I'm just going to call this one picture naming task. There we go. So I have apple.jpg. So let's go ahead and load the rest. Now if I look here, and all I'm going to do is just highlight these. I have 19 and I have one here, so that means I actually have 18 pictures. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually take this and put this on my other screen. And I'm just going to add 17 rows to this. Now I'm adding 17 rows because I have 18 pictures in total. I'm just going to go ahead and start naming those pictures here. So if you're following along at home, just kind of type as I type. Cake, coffee, gift. Whoops, that's not gift. There we go, <laughs> gift. Uh, and then globe. Headphones. Lamp. Laptop. Letter. Mirror. Pillow. And then plant, teddy bear, TV, and wine. There we go. And turns out I actually had 16 and not 18. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete those two. And now if I just go ahead and take my list here, just compare them really quickly. Um, the reason that we recommend doing this, just comparing between what you have here and what's um, listed in your actual pictures, is because if I had any little typo, like for example, if I, instead of letter, actually accidentally typed ladder, um, E prime would bomb out and it would give me a runtime error whenever I would run the experiment and say that it can't find this picture. And, you know, even if there's a tiny typo or if there's a little bit of space, so if I were to do Apple and then start typing a lot of spaces after the word apple.jpg, eprime is actually going to try to count that as the file name of the picture. And if I have that wrong, then it's going to cause the same runtime error. So just compare these quickly to make sure that they look okay. And they look okay for now. So, I mean, if I get an error, that'll be the first place for me to check. So now that I have all my stem images and all my procedure column filled out, 
the only thing I need to do is just change this uh, sequential selection property. I don't necessarily want all of my participants to receive the same images over and over again, so I want them to be you know, in a randomized order. So if I click on this properties page button, click on selection and select random, that's all I need to do. And now I have all my stimuli loaded into the experiment already. So it was pretty easy. So I just did windows and then clicked on close all. I don't like all the windows open. Uh, if anyone needs to see those windows, I can definitely bring them back up for you. All right, so in my trial proc, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to have a, uh, a slide object and the slide object is going to kind of pull two purposes. The first purpose of the slide object is going to be to display the image that participants are going to see. The second purpose is going to be to record the participant speaking. So I'm going to take my slide object and add it to the uh, first uh, first part of the procedure there. And I'm going to rename this one just to stim display. And hit enter. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and double click on this. Now the stim display part is actually pretty easy. All I need to do, and this is pretty basic E-Prime, is go ahead and take this slide image and just drag it and drop it anywhere on the screen. Now I need to change a few properties of it quickly. Uh, the first property I need to change, um, and I just accessed its properties page by making sure that it was highlighted in this uh, sub objects and slide states pane, and then clicked on this sub object properties page button. Now the first, I, the first thing I want to do is actually position it on the screen well. So I want to change the height and width to 50%, and then I want to change the X and Y position to center. If I click apply, that's more what I want. That's more of what I'm looking for there. I'm going to go over to the frame or the general tab here and I need to actually enter the file name. Now instead of entering one file name for each thing, all I need to do is just reference that stim image attribute that I had made in my list object. So I'm going to call this one stim image and click apply and OK. And as you can see, that little icon in there went from gray to purple. Now the way the reason I went from gray to purple is because um, it actually knows that it's going to be getting an image from somewhere. So if I look here, that's that stim image. Uh, if you're like me and always forget what you name your attributes, we have this fun little attributes tab too that you can jump to. So we do recommend checking that out too, or at least I recommend that. All right, so now that I have this visually set up the way I want, let's change some of the properties now so I can actually start recording some audio. So to hop over to my duration input tab, and I'm going to set my duration just to 3000 milliseconds. So not something very long. I obviously want my data logging to be standard because I want it to be both a mix of time audit property, so I want to know how long this was on the screen, but I also am going to be recording the vocal reaction time to this object. So there's going to be an RT value that I'm getting that's going to let me know how long participants stared at this object before they said, okay, this is the object and this is the name of the object. So I'm going to change my data logging to standard. Now I'm going to set my pre-release from same as duration to zero. I'm doing that because this is actually going to impact my audio recording. If I have this set to pre-release the same as duration, E-Prime is going to get to this and immediately move on to the next object in the procedural timeline. And that's not necessarily what I want for a lot of reasons. I want E-Prime to be able to record for the entirety of when I want it to record. Now I'm going to click on add here and I'm going to add a Kronos input mask and I'm going to change my allowable from any because I don't want participants to accidentally press something on the Kronos to advance this object. I'm going to change it to six. And you know, I know that on the Kronos itself, if you look here, there aren't six buttons, but if you remember back to when we were in that responses tab, um, six is actually Kronos's way or its pseudo button, if you will, for the voice key. So basically what happens is whenever participants speak into the microphone, this little Bob Barker looking microphone here, um, it's going to actually log itself as a fake button press and that's what we call the voice key. So it's actually going to get us the reaction time of when participants started talking and it's going to look like a, a press of the six button on the Kronos device. We don't need to set a correct if our only allowable is set to six. So I'm going to go ahead and click apply to save those changes. And then now we need to actually set up the audio recording in E-Prime. So to do that, what I'm going to do is go over to Task Events, and I'm going to click Add. Now I want to begin recording audio whenever the voice key trips, because whenever the voice key trips, that's how I know that participants have begun talking, and that's where I want to start my recording. So what I want to do is I want to go down here to stimdisplay.chronos1.press. So this is letting me know 
that um, the stim displays this object, the Kronos 1 is the first input mask, and the dot press is whenever that voice key is actually just going to first trip. So this lets me know this is when participants first started talking. So I want to select this one and click OK. So then what I did really, really quickly, uh, without really explaining what I did, was my next option here, if you notice everything else is grayed out, I need to go ahead and select task. So the task can be found by clicking on these three little buttons here. And my task is going to be Kronos. So whenever I see a button press on Kronos, or whenever that voice key trips, I want Kronos to be doing something. And that something is going to be recording audio. So I click on Kronos, click OK. And now I pick that something. So I click on the action uh, drop down here, and I want to select audio in record, because obviously I want to be recording through the microphone. Now the source here, I definitely, definitely recommend remaining custom. Um, I don't want to, you know, I don't necessarily recommend changing that to accuracy or data or any of these extras right now, especially for what we're doing. So keep that source as custom. And for data type, we're going to set to something called parameter list. Now, if you're used to sending triggers through ePrime and through task events specifically, this is going to come off as a little weird at first because data type um, doesn't seem like, sh like it should necessarily be parameter list, it seems like it should be, you know, like a long or a byte or something like that. What a parameter list is, is actually what you would enter into custom. Now for about 99% of cases, you definitely don't need to change anything about this custom field here. You can actually keep it completely blank and ePrime is going to record audio in exactly the way that you want. But for you know the few of you who will want to be changing those options, let's go ahead and jump into the Kronos user's manual real quick, I, or the Kronos operator's manual quick, because I do want to show you what these parameters are and, and what their definitions are. Um, so just give me one second to pull this up here. Um, if you are looking for it um, on your computer itself, um, you go to your program files, go to PST, whoops, not performance, let's go to PST, 3.0, documentation, Kronos, and then these are all of the properties of Kronos. So this is actually um, this actually ends up taking you these Kronos here. These um, actually end up taking you to the same pages as if you were to access them through the Kronos device. So let's just go ahead and access them through the Kronos device. Go to Kronos, and then we'll go into Audio In for now and click on the Properties page. There we go. So these are just uh, for audio in. These are all of the different um, all the different properties that you can set. I don't care about the default. <laughs> there we go. So these are just all of the different properties and all of the different parameters that you can add into your Kronos device. And just to go over them very briefly um, in order, the first one is duration. And I'm actually just going to hop back to that tab there into task events. So the first one that I would set is duration. So how long am I going to be recording for exactly? Now I can do that just by typing the number. So if I want a five second recording, I would just type 5,000 milliseconds and then a comma because all these properties here are delimited by a comma. And it says that in that larger article I was talking about. Uh, the next one is I can set the start mode. So um, I talked about that property earlier. It can be either normal or, um, or immediate or onset. So I'm just gonna do immediate. That's actually its default value. Uh, the next one is stop mode, either normal or offset. I can do normal. And all you're doing here is just setting different properties of the Kronos device um, and of the specifically of Kronos' sound recording capabilities by just typing what you want and then um, typing comma. Anything that ePrime doesn't see in here, so if I set this blank, all ePrime does is just set it to the defaults as defined in the Kronos device up here. So Kronos will actually defer to these properties and everything that you set here unless you specify it specifically in that um, in the task events uh, parameter list. For the most part, like I said, you won't ever really need to change that. So I'm actually not going to change that, but just know that that's how you would change that if you ever wanted to. There we go. And then I'm going to add one more thing to my procedure here. I'm actually going to take a weight object and I'm going to put it just after my stim display and I'm going to make sure that it's set to 1000 milliseconds and set my pre-release to 0 milliseconds. Now the reason I'm doing this is because if you logically think about how I've been setting things up in the experiment so far, um, it doesn't actually leave any room for sound recording. So I am actually starting my sound recording, if I look at my task events here, at the press of 
of Chrono. So as soon as the voice key triggers, um, it knows, okay, now we start recording. But if E-Prime is just going to stop after this object and load the next procedure, it's not actually going to give any time at all, so or any time at all to record this audio because it's just going to be, okay, we're done, let's move on to the next procedure. So I'm putting that wait object in there as a one millisecond or a one second buffer. So after I say something into Kronos, E-Prime is going to automatically log, hey, this is when you started saying something, and it's actually going to spend the duration of this wait object actually recording what I'm doing. And it's going to stop afterwards because I'm obviously going to tell it to stop. Um, and that's just going to be through a little bit of inline that I'm going to show you as well. Because all of the properties of Kronos, not only can they be accessed through uh, the GUI like this, but they can also be accessed in inline script. So I'm going to go ahead and save this and just demonstrate what I have so far. So I'm going to go ahead and run this just using e-run test. Because you can actually see the voice key come in, which I like. I am going to just do subject one and session one. And the one thing that I do really like about this is it demonstrates, you know, doing the experiment in little chunks. So let's make sure the audio recording part works before we start with the playback part. So let's actually make sure it works. So headphones, TV, package. And if you look back here, whenever I talk, it'll actually give a new timestamp. So watch laptop, globe, Apple wine, teddy bear, envelope, bottle. All right, so I'm actually going to pause this right now because we don't necessarily need to run through the entire thing, but let's go ahead and exit out of this. And we'll get out of all of this stuff. Experiment terminated by user. It definitely was. And let's go ahead and hop into our folder quick just to see what I have. So if you look, our file actually grew pretty big here. I have picture naming task, and then I have all of these um, all of these sound files. And if I go ahead and play them, I'm just going to play it real quick. So you heard, you know, you heard me respond to this. Package. So there's me saying package. Laptop. Me saying laptop. Okay, cool. So that's one way to access your sound files. Now there's a cooler way to access them that I talked about earlier, but since I aborted out of the task, I don't necessarily have that, um, have the data file for it. So uh, if you see here, I have a text version of it. So if I want to change one of these text versions of my data into an actual eData aid file, I just do e-recovery. It actually comes up there. I'll go ahead and browse for a data file. So if I go to Right here, it'll show my data file that I didn't quite turn into an e or an EDAT file, and I click recover. Go ahead and close. You can see my picture naming task data file here. Now, this is the cool thing that I was talking about a little earlier too. Um, you see here, here's my stem image, um, and then if I take a look specifically at my RT value, this is when I was talking during each and every one of these objects. So this is when I began talking. So some of these places I waited kind of a while because I was explaining some things. But um, that's actually where I, you know, where I began talking. So that's my like reaction time. Now, if I also look here, I have my chronos.file name. So this will tell me on a per trial basis exactly what the file name that relates to that trial is going to be called. So, you know, if you see, I get a little off sync here with the actual trial name. That's because I didn't respond to some of them. So for this trial specifically, I'm looking at chronos.trial-1. So I should have in this sound file, I should be saying TV. And in this sound file here for Chronos 3, if I scroll over here, I should be saying the word laptop. So now we can hop into our sound files. So what was it? 3, I should be saying the word laptop. Let's take a look. Laptop. Exactly. So that's just a cool way to troubleshoot whether or not participants are saying what you think they're saying and to actually kind of line up those sound files with what you have in E-Prime. Save changes. No, I'm not going to save those changes. So let's go ahead and close out of all of these windows. So now that I have the recording portion of it already down, let's go ahead and work on the, uh, the actual playback portion of it. Now, I want this to play back the same, the same word that I had just said on that trial. So it's going to take a little bit of inline script because I want to do a couple of things. 
So let's go ahead and take an inline object and put it just after my wait one object here. And I'm just going to call this one prepare audio file. There we go. And go ahead and double click on it here. Now the first thing I want to do is I want to make sure that E-Prime has definitely stopped recording me. Because if I'm going to be playing that audio file, I need E-Prime to actually make the audio file outside of E-Prime. I need E-Prime to basically make make these files. And the only way that it makes these files is it needs to make sure, okay, I'm definitely done speaking. So what I want to do is I want to just do a little bit of inline script here called Kronos dot audio in dot stop. This is going to definitely make sure that I am no longer recording audio with a Kronos. And then now what I need to do is I need to actually gain access to that file that I was going to be, or that I just recorded. So I need to first make a variable, and this variable is going to keep track of the file name. Um, and for those of you who are new to inline script and you know it seems like I'm going through this a little fast, we have uh, some really great YouTube videos on uh, inline script and that'll kind of help you know how I know how to do some of this stuff. So definitely give those uh, give those a look. Otherwise, if I do something and you know you're a little confused as to oh, why would you do that, definitely let me know in the comments. I'm always happy to help. So let's do dim file as a string. So I'm just making a very simple variable here called string file. And then um, I want a C dot set a trip statement. Actually, first, let's do the string file. String file equals Kronos dot audio in dot get path true. Now what this command does, and this is really the whole reason why I wanted to show you guys this part, is this is going to do a really cool job of not only getting the name of the audio file, but also the entire pathway to that audio file. And I'm actually going to debug.print this so we can watch it, um, watch it populate, because it's really cool what it does. So I'll just do a debug.print statement. And then I'll just say recording file. and then the value of that string file that I just set. Now the last thing I need to do is just do a simple C dot set a trib statement and I'm just going to call this one recording file comma and then it's going to be that string file. Oops, not string tile. There we go, string file. So now what I'm doing here is I'm actually going to first tell Kronos to stop then I'm going to make a very simple attribute that's going to be set to a string data type, which can hold both letters and numbers, um, which can hold both letters and numbers. Then I'm going to set that attribute that I had made equal to the entire path of that sound file that I just made. And then I'm going to debug.print it so I can see that, you know, if anything goes wrong, I can see where it's going wrong. And then I'm setting the same pathway there to the value of an attribute called recording file. And then now all I need to do to play that recording file is I need to just set up um, a sound object to play it. So let's go ahead and set up that sound object. So going to trial proc here, I will take a slide object and put it just after my prepare audio file. And I'm just going to name this one to playback. Go ahead and double click on it to open it. Now I want to still have that picture on the screen because I want some, I want like a prompt underneath, uh, underneath the picture. So let's take this image, uh, slide image sub object and put it anywhere on E-Prime like I just did here. And let's go ahead and change some of the properties so they're the exact same as the properties for my stim display. So if I click on the sub object properties here, the first thing I want to change is that file name that's going to be called stim image of course. I'm going to hop over to frame. I'm going to set my X and Y value to center so it appears in the center of the screen. And if you look here, it'll actually snap to the center. And I'm going to change my height and width to 50%. And then all I want to do now is want to, I want to add some very simple instructions to the bottom of the screen here. And I want to have this just say, if you believe what you said was correct, press 1. If you believe what you said was incorrect, press 2. Um, that way participants can kind of check themselves at the end here. So, press one. Uh, 
and correct press 2. And now that I have that, let's go ahead and click on the properties page icon in the top left hand corner. Click on the duration input tab. I will let this stay infinitely on the screen. I want my standard response here though, because I want to see what participants actually pressed here. We'll add a Kronos device and I will set my allowable to just one and two instead of any here. And then the correct answer is just going to be one for this case. Um, two can be pressed, but you know, I just I want to very quickly and easily um, gauge what participants are judging as accurate on their part. So anytime this object or this playback object shows up in my data file as having an accuracy of one, I know the participants believe they said the correct thing. Go ahead and click apply and OK. Save those changes. Now the only thing we need to do to play sound out of Kronos is just add a slide sound out object, add it anywhere because this doesn't have a visual component. So I can literally put this even over top of these words and it's not going to show up during runtime. And then click on this properties page object here. And now I just need to reference that attribute that I made in my prepare audio file inline. And that one was called recording file. So if I click on this sound out object, click on the properties page, and then set an attribute reference to recording file, that's all I need to do to play that sound out of Kronos again. So I'm going to click apply and OK. I'm going to hop into my prepare audio file. And the only thing I want to do here then is I want to actually just add a quick sleep statement. Um, I'm going to give it a sleep 100 statement there. Uh, what, it, what a sleep statement does is it basically does the same thing that a wait object does, where it literally kind of pauses the experiment very quickly for however long you want it to. And basically I'm pausing the experiment to give E prime enough time to understand that this audio file is here and not to bomb out, and to give it a little bit of time to buffer before it plays back. So I'm going to go ahead and save. We'll go ahead and run it and see if it works. Oh, the other thing I wanted to change was in our welcome screen, you notice that I was just talking because it's what I do. Uh, I have my Kronos device here currently set to any, which means that when I was talking, the voice key itself actually picked up my talking and then moved on. And that's not something I want at all. So I'll just set my allowable to one, two, three, four, and five to know that I have to actually make a button press on Kronos in order to advance from here. So the, the sound in doesn't actually trip it. So we'll go ahead and run again. This time we should have the audio in and the audio out part. I'll name this one a different subject here. All right. So welcome to the experiment. You'll be shown a series of pictures. Let me go ahead and keep this microphone close at hand. Press any button on Kronos to begin. Mirror. Now what I'm doing now is I might be, yeah. So something went wrong there. So let's go ahead and see. So it says unable to find sound file specified. So it said playback.soundbuffer.load. So that means that I'm specifically referring to this sound buffer right here on my playback object. It actually can't find my sound buffer for my recording file. Now, fortunately, that's why I wanted to set this debug.print statement here. I want to set debug.print because I want to see what eprime's even looking for. So if I go to my debug.print here, it says that it's looking for users, admin, desktop, which is spot on so far audio in and out, which is my um, which is my little uh, list object here, or my, not my list, my folder. And then I have picture naming task dot dash two dash one dot chronos. And then I'm looking specifically for trial one or trial dash zero. Now, the reason that I think this happened is if I look in here, and this is something that you also need to keep in mind if you're doing something like this, if I go into stim display and look at my duration here, I actually have it set for a three mil or for three whole seconds. And I was going to demonstrate the sensitivity of the microphone in Kronos by speaking pretty softly and pretty far away from it. So if you notice I had it kind of close to my face earlier when I was speaking, or when I was actually tripping it. What I'm going to get into a situation of right here is I'm actually going to get into the situation where if I don't record anything on this object and E prime jumps into this prepare audio file, this is actually just going to be nothing. So E prime is going to get itself into a situation where it doesn't have any audio file to play back. So that's going to end up being a problem, honestly, because I need audio file for it to play back.
So what I want to do is I want to go back to my stim display and I want to set my duration for infinite for now. So the only thing that will advance this is the fact that I have an audio file now. So the voice key is definitely what's going to trip that. Now if you want to see how to set up some contingencies, we definitely can do that too in inline script. I will have to um, change this prepare audio file around a little bit and I can definitely show you that. So message me if you want to see that. Otherwise, since we're running low on time, I'll just show you this very, very quick fix. But that's something that you definitely need to keep in mind when you make stuff like this in E-Prime is, you know, okay, how could it break? Because, you know, you obviously know the task. You know what's going to happen. What happens if a participant doesn't know what to call the mirror or doesn't know that the thing that I call a bottle is actually a bottle and thinks about it for a while? So I'm going to go ahead and I don't necessarily want those. I will do 2, 1 again. I would like to overwrite. All right, so any button on Kronos, bottle. And then, I don't know if you heard, I have actually pretty bad speakers um, that are playing through this. So it's going to sound not great through these speakers. And I don't know if you guys can even hear this through the microphones, but I'll try that one more time. So if you believe what I said was correct, that was a bottle. Mirror. Mirror. If you guys could hear that, it was now playing out through there. Cake. So it is now playing back exactly what I'm saying. Envelope. Envelope. Television. Television. See? So that's all I need to do. And I'm actually just going to go ahead and uh, exit this right now. As to not, you know, make you guys watch me run the entire thing. If I go ahead and click on this, it'll open up my EDAT file. And I can go ahead and see what my file name was for each one of these. Because now that I actually have a file name on a per trial basis, you'll notice that these trial names and the trial names here in the Kronos file name are lining up. So maybe setting this to infinite was probably our best decision. But keep in mind, we can definitely also alter that too if you'd like to see something like that. But that's really all we have to do to make this picture naming task in E-Prime. And we try to make it as easy as possible. Now I know that we have um, a few minutes left and I do want to take this time just to let you guys know about a few basically a few tips and tricks that a lot of people tend to, not a lot of people, but a few people tend to either mess up or overlook when playing and recording audio in E-Prime. So I just have a little list to go over quick. Um, the first one and probably the most, um, the easiest one to fix a lot of issues is how you actually reference sound being played through Kronos. Now if you look here in my sound out object, I have an attribute reference here. What I can technically do is I can get rid of this attribute reference and I can add a just a solid name. And it's just going to play back this exact picture. It's not an attribute reference, it's just a straight reference to a sound file. We actually recommend using an attribute reference if you're, um, I forget what that attribute's called. Uh, if you are um, playing sound in Kronos, we recommend always using an attribute reference for this file name. Now we recommend always using an attribute reference for the file name because of the way that ePrime handles the file name property and handles um, handles loading it as an attribute. It'll actually end up calling .load before .play this way instead of accidentally just doing .play first. And what that ends up doing is making this an attribute reference. So recording file, making the file name an attribute reference, even if it's playing only one file, is actually going to reduce your onset delay and it'll make the audio file play a little more clearly. Uh, actually, we've even found a case where one user was um, hearing uh, or was trying to play a very short beep in Kronos and it would actually end up playing two times uh, in a row and, and really what that's a product of is it's a product of Kronos trying to play as quickly as possible um, through mix mode one. If it's trying to play as quickly as possible it just kind of messed that up because it was hard coded. So if you have this as an attribute reference that's going to fix probably about 95 percent of all of the audio issues that you have. Now if you happen to be playing audio through Kronos in inline script so for example if you do like Kronos.audio out.play because we know, I know that a lot of users uh, like to do a lot of their audio playing in inline script because um, in some cases it is more millisecond accurate and allows it to play faster. Keep in mind that on a trial by trial basis, you need to also call the dot load property. So just before you call the dot play property, also call dot load. So dot load, and then right after you can call dot play. Um, 
and this actually ends up fixing the exact same set of issues. If you ever have sound that doesn't sound very crisp through Kronos, uh, if you have sound that happens to be, you know, or it sounds like it's playing a lot slower than you need it to, calling that dot load before that dot play is going to fix probably all of your problems there, honestly. Um, the important part too, I also mentioned this a little earlier, but when doing um, audio in recording uh, in Kronos, so if you're recording with this microphone, it is important that you um, that you uh, interact with these onset and offset thresholds. Um, so if you ever find that you know I have participants who are shouting into this microphone trying to get the voice key to trip, it's probably because the offset or the onset threshold is set to very very low. Now we do have a really cool utility in the Kronos Features Explorer that I did want to draw attention to. Uh, the Kronos Features Explorer has uh, something called Calibrate Audio in it, and it's a really cool routine that I definitely recommend checking out. But what it does is it asks you to be quiet, and it just takes in the background noise of the room. So it just, you know, if you're in a noisy room, it takes that into account, and it will adjust the onset and offset thresholds based on how quiet or loud the room that you're in currently is. So it's definitely a really cool utility utility and I do definitely recommend checking that out because those onset and offset thresholds really do solve a lot of problems that people have with either audio recording or with the uh, the voice key tripping in Kronos. So you know definitely make sure that you check that out too. Um, the other thing that I do want to recommend as well too is um, whether or not when you're playing sound and audio if you have just a sound out object. So instead of um, having a slide sound out object like I do in my playback object, just having a normal sound out object in your procedural timeline. It's important to know that in this object here, if I go to my sync property, onset sync is actually set to none. And we do actually recommend um, setting this onset sync to none because what it does is it ignores the vertical blank uh, because this is a non-visual object. So nothing about this slide sound out or this sound out object is going to draw to the screen and actually doesn't have a visual component at all. So we don't actually sync it with the onset of an object on the screen. And we make sure that we don't um, we make sure that we don't try to sync it to a screen refresh. You can do that. You can set the onset sync to vertical blank, and ePrime is actually going to rate, wait for a screen refresh in order to play the sound. But since onset sync is set to none, or should be set to none, and the sound object doesn't have a visual component, it doesn't make any sense for you to set the, or the onset sync to vertical blank because all that's going to end up being is onset delay and sound onset latency. It's just going to keep adding sound onset latency to. Um, to your audio presentation, you definitely don't want that. So we recommend keeping this audio sync set to none. And then the last thing that I recommend, and this is especially for people who are trying to get pretty, pretty involved in sound, and they want very specific playback options um, in Kronos or even in sound in ePrime in general, and this isn't something that I've talked about in a live stream before actually, is that um, ePrime, no matter what you set your sound to or whatever audio file that you have in however you've made it if you make a sound file eprime is actually going to convert that audio file when it plays back to 48 kilohertz 16-bit stereo uh, and that's really important because that's actually what the uh, what the windows kernel uses to play sound um, it uses this format in its kernel itself and it's not something that eprime specifically sets we just try to play it as quickly as we can now if you want to play sounds with the absolute most precision absolute best millisecond accuracy we do recommend making sure that your audio file is compatible with 48 uh, 48 kilohertz and 16 bits per sec or 16 bit stereo and that's because if it's not eprime is actually going to adjust the audio file to that in order to play it anyway so that's actually going to reduce a lot of your sound onset latency too is if you set it to those properties so that's actually all the information i have today thank you guys very much um, like i said if you guys have any questions feel free to either leave a comment below or email us at support.psdnet.com i actually have the support page open right here this is my version of the support page so it might look a little different from yours um, i'm an admin on it but if you look at the top here on your screen it's going to say submit a ticket go ahead and submit a ticket make sure that you're signed in first um, that way you don't have to worry about signing in um, but yeah, submit a support ticket if you have any questions. As always, um, you know, feel free to like the video, subscribe to our page. It lets me keep doing what I do here. If you have any recommendations for videos, if you know you find, oh, I'm really struggling with this aspect of ePrime, or I really wish I could see this task being made, let me know. I'm always happy to adapt and make videos that you guys want to see. Otherwise, thank you guys very much for showing up today and for watching the video, and have a great day.